Welcome to the third session in our course on Rome, Republic to Empire. This week, I want to talk about the growth of inequality and corruption, which is in itself a cheerless title. Though, of course, if you are one of the beneficiaries of inequality and corruption, life can be very jolly indeed. As you can see from this Pompeian wall painting, you can see two rather wealthy people having what I have not the slightest doubt is a very good time and there on the far left you have a slave girl who is passing what may be a box of cosmetics. The man is pouring wine into his mouth from a glass drinking object of some kind. As I said if you are one of the beneficiaries of this system Rome in the 2nd century BC was enjoying rapid and sustained progress. Sadly, this rapid and sustained progress was not equally enjoyed by the population of the city or indeed by the great body of Roman citizens and it was for the most part not wholly welcomed by those people in the provinces who paid for the great enrichment of the Roman governing class. However, let us have a look at the first of these slides, and this takes us back to what we discussed last week. The Second Punic War, when Hannibal invaded Italy, was not just a matter of a few pitched battles. The disaster was not the loss of those three large armies in the battles that were fought with Hannibal. The real cost of Hannibal's invasion was felt by the people of Italy. Hannibal was in Italy for 11 years. In that time, he devastated the country, or rather he and the Roman resistance, he and the Roman armies of resistance, devastated Italy during that 11-year period. I gave you this rather fragmentary and disconnected sequence of statistics. In 218 BC, there were apparently 270,000 Roman citizens. By 208 BC, this was down to 137,000 Roman citizens. These are the heads of households, so there were 270,000 households in Italy headed by Roman citizens. Ten years later, this was substantially down. This may not be an entirely true statistic, but it is a statistic that gives you the probable direction of change during the time that Hannibal invaded Italy. And by the end of that war, at least a third of Italy was in ruins. Imagine Europe in 1945, Eastern and Central Europe, these very productive agricultural areas, have been fought over during an 18-month period. The Germans have stretched out great minefields, the Soviets have rolled over those minefields, artillery, the general destruction of agricultural capital, the digging up of land, the loss of drainage, and of course the driving away and the killing of the people who work on the land. It isn't surprising that much of Europe in 1947, which suffered a rather chilly winter, came very close to outright famine. If you think of Western Europe, if you think of Northern France and Belgium, for several years after the Great War, when these devastated areas had to be gradually brought back into cultivation, then you have some idea of what was suffered in Italy during that 11-year period. However, Europe in the 20th century was better able to recover from these great devastations than Italy was in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC. We are talking here about ancient economies where the rate of capital accumulation was very low. 
and where populations tended to grow rather slowly except in unusual circumstances. So you have the physical devastation of Italy, the destruction of the land and the death or displacement of large numbers of people who had made Italy such a wealthy territory before the Hannibal invasion. You then have the secondary causes, the fact that so many of the surviving freehold class in Italy had been swept up into the Roman armies and sent off to conquer Spain and North Africa. Then, after the war was over, once Carthage had been stripped of its Spanish and North African territories, Italy was opened to the free importation of food from these newly conquered territories. And the southern Mediterranean, so long as it isn't desert, is a great deal more productive in agricultural terms than the northern shores of the Mediterranean, also, much of the food imported into Italy was not brought in via market processes. It came in as various forms of tribute from the conquered territories to the Roman state. Italy, as it was trying to recover from this 11 years of devastation, found that its markets were awash with relatively low-priced food from Spain and North Africa. Now, I said that populations in the ancient world tended to grow slowly. Indeed, overall, for much of the period of classical antiquity, population on the whole was either static or slightly declining. However, it does seem that after the loss of so many people in Italy during the Second Punic War, that population grew back afterwards very quickly, and it does seem that within about 50 years, the population of Italy was roughly where it had been at the beginning of this great war with Carthage. It was a very different kind of Italy, because although population did recover, this recovered population found itself living in an Italy with a radically different structure of land ownership. Before Hannibal's invasion, it does seem that most of Italy was divided up into small peasant proprietorships. You had large numbers of peasant families scattered over the whole of Italy, owning and farming their own ancestral land. By the end of the Second Punic War, at least a third of Italy was ownerless. The owners of the land had been killed, they had disappeared. It was not possible, even if the authorities had been particularly interested, to locate the owners and to restore their property. Large tracts of Italy after the war were depopulated, they were without owners who could be easily identified. Also, large areas of land had been confiscated by the Roman state from those cities and those districts which had sided with the Carthaginian invaders. The question was what to do with these large tracts of land. The Roman state was desperately short of money. Wars are expensive. The Romans had fought this giant war for 11 years with Carthage. It had invaded, it had taken over Spain and North Africa. In order to fund these long-range military and naval operations, the state had needed large amounts of money it was not able to collect these large amounts of money from any kind of regular taxation, even from semi-irregular forms of taxation, such as confiscating the land of people who'd sided with the enemy. The Roman state was desperately short of money. It had borrowed money. It had borrowed very large amounts of money. We are not able to say 
what the indebtedness of the Roman state was because ancient historians were on the whole not as interested in statistical and financial matters as we have been for the past 400 years. And of course, the raw material, the raw literary sources on which we could base our own estimates are lacking. We do not have the evidence to talk about the scale of the Roman state's indebtedness, but it does seem that the Roman state had borrowed large amounts of money to finance this war. So you have the heavy indebtedness of the Roman state and you have about a third of Italy which is depopulated and without identifiable owners. The solution to these problems was that the public lands, as they were called, were granted on very low rents, nominal rents indeed, or what we would call peppercorn rents, to non-patrician rich men in Italy who had made large loans to the Roman state. It is very likely that these nominal rents were at some kind of market value at the beginning. Devastated agricultural land is not worth very much money. Granting these lands out at very low rents may have reflected the prevailing market conditions. Very quickly, the economic and demographic recovery in Italy raised the actual rental values of these lands considerably above the contracted rents. A lot of the land was sold outright to those patricians, those members of the Roman upper class who still had money to spend. Either the lands were sold outright with perfect title, or again they were leased on the same easy terms as to the war creditors. There were laws which tried to limit the amount of land that the patricians, that the Roman upper classes could own. There were laws that tried to limit the amount of land that any one patrician family could hold, but in the circumstances of the early 2nd century BC, these laws could not be enforced, or they simply were not enforced. If you were to analyse this newly emerging situation on the land from about the year 190-180 BC, you could justify it very easily. The state, as I've said, was desperately short of money. It owed vast amounts of debt. We're not quite sure to whom, and we're not quite sure how much, but we can be sure that the Roman state was heavily indebted, and it needed to do something about the repayment of those debts. The Roman state found itself in possession of a very large amount of land, and it was necessary that this land should be brought back into use. You can't leave it empty, you can't leave it as desert, you can't leave it to be filled with bandits. You need to do something with this land, there was nobody else with any money to spend. If the Roman state wanted to relieve its financial pressures, and if it wanted to offload this land, there really was a limited class of people with which it could do business. And again, I'll say that the actual market value of this land may have been very, very low. How much will you pay for a piece of land that is absolutely worthless in agricultural terms, where there is nobody able or willing to work the land, and where the title may not be completely secure? The answer is that you will take this piece of land as a bit of a gamble, as a very risky investment. Indeed, many years ago, my wife and I were driving home from Slovakia. We decided to drive through the Czech Republic and we found ourselves in the Sudetenland. 
That is that disputed tract of land that borders what used to be Czechoslovakia and Germany. This was about 97% German before 1945. At the end of the Second World War, the entire German population, over a million people, were expelled. They were given 48 hours to leave and they were allowed to take a few personal belongings with them. The land was then taken over by the communist government of Czechoslovakia and granted out to various Czechs. By the late 1990s, when my wife and I were driving through it, the communist system had fallen. The German government was still insisting that the German citizens who had been dispossessed in 1945 continued to have a good title to the land. Germany, of course, is considerably larger and richer and generally more powerful than the Czech Republic. And although the Czech Republic has spent the last 30 years insisting that what is called the Benesch Decrees of April 1945 that expelled the German population are still valid. And although in the early 1990s, the Czech government, the Czechoslovak government indeed, spent some time asking the British, Russian and American governments whether they still regarded these decrees as legally valid, the land as we drove through it in the late 1990s was almost completely empty. The land in the Sedaton land is pretty well unsaleable because if you buy a farm in the Sudeten land, if you buy a house in Carlsbad or Marienbad, you may well find, indeed you will find, that your title is contested by perhaps two or three different groups of people. And for that reason, if you are offered property in these territories, you will either walk away from the deal or you will pay a very, very low price because what you're buying is a gamble. You may find that you're in possession of a valuable piece of property, or you may find in five years' time that it's taken away from you with no compensation, or at the best, nominal compensation. And so for this reason, the Italian land that was granted out by the Roman state to the various creditors of the Roman state was probably bordering on the worthless at the beginning. This situation, which seemed very temporary in the 190s BC, then continued for several generations. And what had been a bit of a gamble at the beginning was, after two or three generations, an established fact in Italian life. The land had been granted out on variable but long leases. The idea was that the Roman state was unable to repay the debts it had contracted in the war against Hannibal. The land was not given with a freehold title to the creditors. It was granted on variable leases. The Roman state was at liberty to cancel the leases and to resume ownership of the land if the creditors were repaid. After a few generations, however, the land was a great deal more valuable than the loans that had been extended in the first place. None of these new leaseholders wanted to have their debts repaid. They weren't interested in getting back what their grandfathers had lent to the Roman Republic. They had a great deal of valuable farming land in Italy, and they were going to keep hold of it. They didn't want to be repaid. And it didn't finish there. You have the growth of very large consolidated land holdings in Italy. Remember that food imports from Sicily and North Africa and Spain have made a lot of the traditional small-scale farming in Italy uncompetitive. The new consolidated land holdings, these great tracts of land, a million acres here, a million acres there, were 
organised as industrial farms worked by slaves, and there were very large numbers of slaves available. Indeed, for most purposes, there were unlimited numbers of slaves available because of the continuing wars of expansion fought by the Roman Republic. Prisoners of war, and prisoners of war also include those civilians in the districts invaded and taken by the Roman Republic, were generally enslaved, sent off to market, and many of them found themselves in Italian chain gangs. There's a picture of some of these slaves. They have metal collars about their necks, and these collars are secured one to each other. Someone is leading these slaves off. These are rather big, rather strong men, and they will end up chained up together in groups of ten, working in the fields of Italy under the lash. A most unpleasant way of farming a piece of land, but probably economically efficient, let's put it that way. Otherwise, the land was increasingly used for cattle or sheep or olives because there was not much point growing corn in Italy. It was so cheap when it was brought in from Sicily and from North Africa. You have a situation in which Italy is divided between these great consolidated industrial estates and large numbers of little freeholds. Of course, the owners, or shall we call them the possessors, of these large consolidated industrial estates are always interested in expansion. They want to make their land holdings larger, or perhaps they look at a map and they notice that the consolidation is not as perfect as they would like because there is this great notch cut into their land holdings by these continuing peasant proprietorships. For this reason, the remaining small freeholders in Italy found themselves under pressure from their much wealthier neighbours. Imagine bailiffs turning up, making offers to buy the land. And if those offers are refused, then quite often the small freeholders would find themselves taken to court. Frivolous cases, but you know that frivolous cases can be expensive, they can be thoroughly vexatious, and the only way to settle these cases was to sell the land at the price offered by their wealthy neighbours. Otherwise, the wealthy neighbours would set the lawyers to work, who would dig up problems with the title to these small freeholdings, which had been in family's possession maybe for centuries. But if you have any experience of property law in England, even with the Land Registration Act 1925, you'll find that almost every land title in this country can be contested. Even registered titles are not as secure as the law claims to make them. If you have large amounts of unregistered land in the ancient world, then, as I said, the titles will never be completely secure. A good lawyer can quite easily get small neighbours evicted, and the land will just be gobbled up by these great estates. We don't know what proportion of the land was owned by these rich estates. We don't know how many small freeholders remained on the land. We know that all the way through the history of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire itself, there were large numbers of peasant proprietors in Italy, but we don't know how many. What we do know is that in the 2nd century BC, considerable numbers of these proprietors were squeezed out. They were squeezed out by honest open market sales of land to their wealthier neighbours, or by various kinds of coerced purchase, or in some cases simply by outright violence. You send 150 men with clubs onto your neighbour's land, you 
drive off the cattle, you spoil the land, you burn the houses, and you tell the people, if you're still here tomorrow, we'll kill you. That was done as well. Large numbers of people were driven from the land. Many of these people went off to what are called the colonies of settlement, little equivalents of Australia and New Zealand in British terms. These were the colonies established in Sicily, in Spain, in North Africa, new cities, new territories, which would be filled with Roman citizens, and it was possible for these people to have a very nice new life in these new colonies of settlement. Many of them, however, didn't leave Italy. Many of them found their way in the big cities, and that meant Rome. Again, we don't have statistics, but it is possible that Rome, in about 300 BC, maybe in 250 BC, was a city of 50,000 people, which is considerable by the standards of the ancient world, where most cities were unlikely to go past about 20,000 people. A city of 50,000 people was considerable in those days, but it seems that Rome had expanded by about 100 BC to maybe 500,000 people. That makes it a giant city, an unusually large city by the standards of the day. It may have made Rome the third or the fourth most heavily populated city in the world. It was not as large as Alexandria, it was not as large as some of the Chinese and perhaps the Indian cities, but it was one of the biggest cities in the world. Nowadays, a city of 500,000 people can be rather a pleasant place to live. Even cities of 20 or 30 million people can be rather pleasant. If you live in a rather nice part of London, if you live in an averagely nice part of London, Life can be rather nice, as long as you have somewhere to park, as long as you have a garden, and as long as you can pay your gas bills and your water bills and everything else, it can be rather pleasant. But you see, these big modern cities, London, New York, Shanghai, these are spread out over very large areas because we have efficient public transport and we have efficient networks of distribution for food and water and other utilities. Ancient cities tended to cover small areas. Imagine an area the size of the City of London with 500,000 people crowded into it. Imagine trying to get food and water into those areas. Imagine trying to keep these places clean and you can imagine that those 500,000 people lived mostly in conditions that we would consider unacceptably poor. Rome became a vast conurbation of slums. And when I say conurbation, I'm not talking about an area the size of Greater London in our own day. I'm talking about an area that has burst by necessity beyond its ancient bounds, to which some limit is placed by the technology of the day to its continued geographical expansion outwards. There's the cover image again, a wealthy banquet in Pompeii. If you were one of the winners in this process of social change, if your grandfather had lent money to the Roman Republic during the war with Hannibal, when the state was willing to offer almost any terms, and if your grandfather had accepted some of those leases on very easy terms at the end of the war, you might find yourself living in a very nice, very large house in the centre of Rome, weighted on hand and foot by a vast tribe of slaves, and you could afford what by the standards of the day 
is a very nice life. By our standards, the lives were not that wonderful, but I'll come to that a bit later. But there were lucky winners. Every process of social change has winners and losers. It's a question of how many winners and how many losers. In this process, there were a few winners and many losers, but for the winners, undoubtedly life was, by the standards of the day, remarkably pleasant. But let's talk about the losers. Here are some pictures showing attempted reconstructions of the kind of properties that were built in Rome to house the urban poor. Here they are rather larger. Now I'm sure you'd agree that these look rather jolly, don't they? Nice big buildings, plain brick, unfaced with marble, maybe not plastered, maybe not painted, we're not quite sure, but these are rather elegant, solid-looking structures, and you can imagine that they are very nice inside. Perhaps that's how they were intended to be when they were built, but Rome is a city bursting with people. Property is expensive to buy, expensive to rent, and you need to squeeze as many people as you can into these buildings. Put aside any modern beliefs you may have about the niceness of these buildings. And I'm sure that most of you, I included, I'm sure that all of us would be very interested in having a top floor flat in one of these blocks, especially something overlooking the centre of Rome. But put that aside and imagine the reality. There is no piped water to these buildings. Of course, there's no electricity. There are no utilities. What you might have is five or six or ten or even twenty families crowded into a single large room. There is almost no privacy. If there is privacy, it is secured by putting up makeshift screens and curtains between the various families. Any water has to be brought in and carried upstairs. No lifts, no service lifts, no way of getting things up to the top floors except by carrying them. Any water that is used in these buildings has to be brought in by hand and collected from local fountains. That means not a lot of washing. The water brought in is for drinking or for cooking. Cooking. How is cooking done? Open fires, mostly. So you've got these timber-framed buildings. They are bursting at the seams with people. And every single one of those families will have a little brazier boiling food all day. You can imagine that there is endless potential for fires. And many of these blocks did catch fire. There were no fire exits. There was none of the careful planning of exits for people in a hurry from these buildings. So you had continual fires in these buildings, and they claimed large numbers of lives. Also, although in the reconstructions these buildings look rather solid, many of them were very cheaply constructed, unseasoned timber, rather thin unseasoned timber, unable to bear the loads placed on it, cheap semi-baked bricks buildings that were not designed with any kind of durability in mind. Quite often, these blocks would simply collapse. You would go to bed, you'd be woken up by a loud creaking noise, then there'd be a crash, and then the entire building would collapse, taking several hundred people with it. And of course, there were still open fires burning, and so the building would collapse, the cooking stoves, such as you could call them, would still be lighted. The ruins would catch fire. 
what was in daylight a rather solid block of flats would in the morning be a heap of smouldering ruins with a smell of burned human flesh filling the air. What did these poor people eat? We like to think of the Mediterranean diet as varied and pleasant. You think of all those nice fresh tomatoes and the crisp, freshly baked white bread, the olives and everything else. Well, yes, tomatoes came from the Americas in the 19th century, but everything else was there in the ancient Mediterranean. But that wasn't there for the poor. What poor people mostly ate was a kind of porridge. You buy unground corn in the market, you bring it home, you mill it into a very rough flour. You don't have the means to make this into bread because you don't have ovens. You can't afford meat, vegetables and fruit. Those are available, but not always. What you and your seven or eight children will eat three times a day is a kind of porridge made from this roughly milled corn. It'll be boiled in a pot, and the pot will be kept boiling day after day after day. As it gets a bit lower, you top it up with water, throw in a bit more of this corn. I think it would look like a kind of off-white wallpaper paste. You would flavour it with a bit of salt, with some garlic and other herbs, and every so often you'd throw in some bits of pork fat or other meat that you've managed to gather in various ways. That would be the staple diet of the poor. Imagine 20 families crowded into a single flat. No privacy except whatever can be obtained by hanging curtains between each family. No running water. Everything and everyone is rather smelly. No proper cooking facilities. Then again, most ordinary people didn't have proper cooking facilities until the early 20th century in this country. Food was a matter of a cauldron of what we would consider wallpaper paste, flavoured with salt and a few herbs, and that is what people would have to eat. How did people get the money to buy this corn? How did people get the money to pay the rent on these buildings? Again, you can't compare Rome in the second century BC with anywhere in the modern West. You can't compare it with London or Manchester and Sheffield in the 19th century because these were large industrial or at least commercial cities. The ancient world took a rather hostile view of paid employment. If you're asked, what do you do for a living? Oh, I work for Hewlett Packard in human resources, or I'm a research chemist with Pfizer. Mm, research chemist with Pfizer may not be quite so admirable as it would have been a few years ago, but that's another matter. What I'm saying is that there is no sense of shame in our own civilization, if you confess to being a salaried employee, nobody says, oh, a salaried employee, oh, that's, that's rather low, isn't it? The only thing most people ask is, oh, who is your employer? And perhaps if someone is rather pushy, how much do you earn? You don't look down on anybody who works for a living, who works uh, as a salaried employee. Whereas in the ancient world, working for somebody else was considered halfway to slavery. Oh, if you ran your own shoemaking shop, if you ran your own laundry, if you were a hairdresser, the upper classes might look down on you because you were in trade, but there was no special disgrace attached to running your own business. The disgrace was attached to those people whom you might employ. As I said, they were considered halfway to slavery. So there was no culture of paid employment. Indeed, if you did run a sandal-making workshop, 
you would not think of looking for employees among the free poor. You wouldn't put the word around, I need people to do this job for these hours, for this rate of pay. A waste of time. You would buy slaves and they would do the work under your direction. If paid employment is not desired and is not offered, how do these large numbers of people in the growing Rome of the 2nd century BC survive? Oh, there's a picture showing life for the poor. It's a famous Hellenistic statue from the 2nd century BC. It doesn't show life in Rome, but it shows life for the poor. The best way out of this life was to get beastly drunk. You drink enough wine and you don't notice that you're cold, that you're hungry, that your body is riddled with vermin that your children are dying of hunger or of diseases which nobody appears to understand, and that you have absolutely zero prospects in life. The little farm in central Italy that your father had once owned, that is fading into the realms of ancestral memory. So you get drunk. You get drunk as often as you can and you stay drunk. Let's talk about how these people lived. Now, here is a film which I imagine everybody has watched. Have you all seen The Godfather? It's quite a good novel. I haven't seen the film all the way through, but I did read the novel many years ago. And the part that stuck with me, the part that I most remember, is in the early part. The novel starts with the marriage of Don Corleone's daughter, Many people turn up to the wedding, it's quite a large event, but you have a little funeral director, an Italian immigrant to America, Amerigo Bonacera. He's honest, he's hard-working, he stays completely out of trouble, he avoids Don Corleone because he regards him as a criminal, which of course he is until one day his daughter is assaulted by two very well-connected young men. These young men are arrested, they're prosecuted, but the judge gives them a suspended sentence. Amerigo regards himself as rather short-changed by the American system in which he formerly believed. He now says, for justice we must go to Don Corleone. He goes to Don Corleone at the wedding and Corleone says, I can't do a Marlon Brando impression, so do forgive me. Bonacera, Bonacera, what have I ever done to make you treat me so disrespectfully? If you'd come to me in friendship, this scum who ruined your daughter would be suffering this very day. And if by some chance an honest man like yourself made enemies they would become my enemies, and then they would fear you. To which Bonacera replies, Be my friend, Godfather. Notice the hand-kissing in the image. The deal is made, but it's not a deal as such. It's not a market transaction. It is a swearing of fealty in exchange for undisclosed services. Don Corleone does give some explanation of what this new relationship entails. Some day, and that day may never come, I will call upon you to do a service for me. But until that day, consider this justice a gift on my daughter's wedding day. The young men who got off on the charges of sexual assault are grabbed by some of Corleone's associates, let's call them, and they're beaten with an inch of their life, and justice of a sort is done. Now, this is the mafia. Whether it works in quite this way nowadays, I can't tell you, but this is the traditional popular culture view of the mafia. It is a blight on modern life. It is an undesirable feature It is something that governments claim to be working to eradicate, though 
in practice, I should imagine most governments are perfectly happy with the arrangement because the politicians themselves are on the take. This is not what we would consider a normal and certainly not a desirable way to organise life in a modern society. But this is how the ancient world worked. The ancient world you could describe as a giant mafia society. Patron and client. Think of that relationship between Amerigo Bonacera, the Italian funeral director, and Don Corleone, and then make it absolutely general and not only socially accepted, but integrated into the law and administration of an entire empire. And you get some idea of how the poor lived in the ancient world. There was no public welfare system, there was no police, there was no effective criminal justice system. There was, as I've said, a general contempt for any kind of market-based employment. Instead, what you had was clientage, the relationship of a patron with his client or his clients. If you are a wealthy and powerful Roman, if you're one of the grandchildren of somebody who took on those leases on the public land, what you will do is you will gather around yourself a large number of clients. Some of these may be rather significant people in their own right. To go back to the Godfather example, Amerigo Bonacera was an established businessman. He ran a respected funeral director business. It may be that some of your clients will be hairdressers. They may run schools. They may own bathing complexes. They may do all sorts of things. But many of these people will be poor with nothing to offer but their own muscles. You will gather as many of these clients around you as possible because they are useful to you. You want these people to vote for you in an election. It may be that you want some of these people to stir up riots to prevent your political competitors from being able to organise their meetings. You may want somebody to commit a murder for you because somebody's life is inconvenient to you and you need this person removed, you'll have a look through your list of clients, point at someone and say, get him to do it. What you do is you provide food, little gifts of money, and perhaps some kind of subsidised accommodation to your poorer clients, in return for which they will turn up and praise you in public, they will cheer you, they will vote for you if they're Roman citizens. They will do whatever you want of them. That is how these 500,000 very poor people were maintained in Rome. And this was a relationship not only permitted by the laws, it was established in law. It was an established legal rule that a patron and client could not give evidence against each other in court. And it was accepted that if a client or a patron died, his successor would step into the same relationship. So these client-patron relationships would continue in a very stable manner for several generations. Every morning, if you were a wealthy Roman, you would present yourself in the great entrance hall of your house and your clients would all attend, or many of them would attend, to greet you. You would know the names of your more important clients and you would give these people invitations to dinner, you might give them gifts of money, you'd go up, you'd greet them by name, you'd have a small conversation with them you'd move on, and then there was the great crowd of the more or less unwashed poor who would turn up outside your door shouting your name and your general praises. You would go out, you'd smile and wave, 
you would have a special person behind you, a nomenclator, who might be able to give you the names of some of your clients. That is how the rich and the poor interacted in the later Roman Republic, a matter of client and patron relationship. So far, I've spoken about the growth of inequality in Italy as a function of changes in the ownership of land, the concentration of land ownership into the hands of a small class of very rich freeholders or state leaseholders. But remember, Rome is the head of a growing empire, and the imperial territories taken over increasingly are no longer relatively small areas in northern Italy. It's now the whole of Spain, the whole of North Africa. It may be the whole of Greece. It will be areas in the territory of modern Turkey. These districts all pay tribute, and they all need to be administered in various ways. They're part of the empire. They must be governed as part of the empire. And here Rome began to face a problem that is faced by every empire that has free institutions in its home country. It's a problem that we faced in the 18th and 19th centuries. How do you reconcile free institutions at home with a growing empire abroad? The Romans grappled with this problem. We've learned much from their solution to the problem because it was disastrous. But the Romans grappled with this problem and they came up with the best solution that they could imagine. And the solution is this. There is the Roman constitution, or at least there is a graphical representation of the Roman constitution. Every year you have elected magistrates. These are mostly the members of wealthy and noble families. The two go together, wealthy and noble, for the most part. In the earlier Middle Republic, you would put yourself up for the consulship, you would stand for election before the Roman Assembly as a matter of family pride or from public spirit. My father was consul, my grandfather was a consul, I want to be a consul and I want my son to be a consul. It's part of my family's tradition and part of our duty to the Roman state and the Roman people. Or you will say, I have a number of unusual qualities which will allow me to save the Republic in these difficult times. To do this, I must seek election as a consul. All of this changes in the 2nd century BC because now, if you are elected a consul, at the end of your one-year term of office, you will be assigned a province to govern. You may be given this province for one year or for five years, or you may, in unusual circumstances, be given this province for a longer period than five years. And it's no longer a matter of going to a small town in northern Italy where you spend most of your time as governor settling legal disputes between farmers over whose pig this really was or what compensation should be paid because somebody bull broke loose and went and smashed up somebody else's barn. You now find yourself in Syracuse or in Utica or in Corinth, or somewhere, somewhere rather nice, somewhere rather wealthy, where it is difficult, even if you don't take bribes, not to grow very rich during your term of office. You could often go out to govern Sicily or to govern North Africa, and after a few years, you would come back gigantically rich. You would restore the family fortunes, and indeed you would enhance them. Of course, when you have those incentives attached at the end of your term of office, seeking election to one of these offices gradually ceases to be a matter 
or family pride or public spirit, it becomes a necessary gateway to five years of gigantic enrichment. You look at one of these elective magistrates and you say, you may have to spend a year supervising the cleaning of the streets. Oh dear, I suppose I can get somebody else to do the work for me. I'd better do it. The reason you want to be elected to that office is not because you want to perform the offices. It is because you're looking at those nice juicy governorships that will be handed out to the winners at the end of their term of office. That turns elections into competitions for enrichment. You must win this election because you must get yourself a juicy governorship. And because you must win this election, you'll bribe the voters, you'll bribe them with your own money, or you'll bribe them with public money. You will try to disrupt the meetings and general electoral activities of your rivals for office. Rome will be filled with armed gangs of the unwashed poor, all running round trying to stop each other's patrons from winning an election. Rome becomes increasingly violent, increasingly riotous, increasingly corrupt. So there is the money that the upper classes have managed to secure by those easy leases on Italian land. There is the money they've managed to obtain from provincial governorships after winning elections to public office in Rome. You then have the occasional sources of enrichment, the money from military loot, If, again, you're conquering an area of northern Italy, the most you may be able to show for this at the end is several hundred pigs, a herd of sheep, and a few slaves. If you have conquered Macedon, if you've conquered the whole of Greece, you will have wagon loads of statues and paintings and gold and silver bullion and teams of relatively well-educated and productive slaves to march through Rome in your triumph. All of the booty taken at the end of these wars of conquest in the eastern and southern Mediterranean are supposedly the property of the Roman state, but in practice large amounts of money stuck to the fingers of the victorious generals. So there's money from military loot. Oh, there are representations of a Roman triumph. Remember, at the end of the first war with Carthage, the Roman state imposed a crushing indemnity. It was supposed to pay the costs for Rome of having fought that war, and it was supposed to cripple Carthage. It did neither, but... It was common for the winner at the end of a successful war to impose financial penalties on the losing side. And this continued. In 197 BC, Philip II of Macedon, at the end of the First Macedonian War, was made to pay 100,000 talents of silver as a war indemnity. Now, I've worked out that A talent of silver, one talent, weighs about 66 pounds. If you take 16 ounces of silver to the pound of silver, and if you multiply that as required, you get this 1,000 talents of silver as about 19 million pounds, which is a large sum of money but not as much as the indemnity loaded onto King Antiochus III in 188 BC. He was made to pay 15,000 talents of gold. And again, if you make the necessary calculation, and I looked up the bullion price of gold as of today's date, it's about £1,500 an ounce at the moment. In today's value, the indemnity paid by Antiochus III was about £1.6 trillion. 
this was not a uniquely large indemnity. These are seriously large amounts of money pouring into the Roman treasury and sticking to an unknown number of fingers along the way. Because most of this cash, which was in theory the property of the Roman people, found its way into the pockets of the well-connected. You then have bribery by foreign powers. The Eastern Mediterranean, after the death of Alexander the Great, was unstable. There were continual wars fought between the Greek kings of Egypt and the Greek kings of Syria and the Greek kings of Macedon and so on. By the 2nd century BC, these kingdoms mostly didn't bother going to war. They found it convenient and they found it increasingly necessary to take their disputes before the Roman Senate. And it was discovered that the best way to obtain a judgment of the Roman Senate for your particular cause is to bribe the senators. The bribery of senators and other officials in the Roman Republic became normal. It became endemic. And King Ptolemy XII, Auletes, the father of Cleopatra, he was very skilled in the art of bribing Roman senators, and that's how he got himself put back on the throne of Egypt after his eldest daughter led a coup against him. Ptolemy gave and promised so much in the way of bribes to the Roman Senate that for many years afterwards, Egypt was heaped with taxes in order to make good on these promised bribes. So politics are corrupted. Politics are degraded. The people are degraded. The city is swollen with people, all living in what we would consider to be unimaginable poverty. This is a vast, unemployed and unemployable underclass. At the same time, the possessing classes, they are enriched on a gigantic scale with the value of those public lands in Italy and then from the proceeds of empire. City politics are no longer about vote for Marcus because he will fix the drains. It's now vote for Marcus and collect five gold coins, or vote for Marcus or else. And Marcus doesn't care about the city drains. That's something that he has to deal with as an unpleasant prelude to five years of enrichment from a governorship somewhere in Asia Minor. I say in the slides you have the growing realisation. I'm sure it was realised as early as the second century BC, but it didn't become critical until the middle of the first century BC. But you have the realisation in practice, if not completely intellectually, that the constitution of a central Italian city-state will not function as the constitution of a large and growing empire. And this is the problem that the British and French governments faced and settled with considerably greater skill than the Romans did in the 18th and 19th centuries. If you have any knowledge of British politics in the 18th century, the power of the East India Company, the power and wealth of the East India Company, were a continual worry for everyone in politics. Britain finds itself at the head of a growing empire. How do you govern North America? Didn't work out very well. How do you govern India? India has been conquered by a limited company with its headquarters in central London. The East India Company is possibly richer than the British state. It rules over larger numbers of people than the British state. 
what is to be the relationship between the East India Company and the British state? One of the big issues in politics from about 1750 all the way down to the end of the East India Company in, I think, 1859. All through that century of worry and experiment, the example of what happened to Rome was in front of everyone concerned, not just the historians, but the politicians and, in some degree, the electors. The Romans didn't know how to solve the problem. How do you turn the constitution of a small Italian city-state into the constitution of a large and growing empire? And this is what brings down the Republic in the end, because nobody ever thought of a solution to this problem that would maintain the Roman Republic as more than an ornamental attachment to what I keep calling a divine right military dictatorship. So that's what I have to talk about today. Next week, I want to talk about the institution of slavery in the Roman world. So that's all I have to say for the moment. Any questions?